Medistand. Understanding Medicine. I am Professor Azizur Rahman. <clears throat> Today we are going to start a series of lectures on valvular heart diseases. And as you know, rheumatic heart disease as a complication of infection, streptococcal infection is still common in our country and it is often missed in the childhood and that results in late sequelae in the form of valvular heart diseases. There could be other causes also like congenital and degenerative but rheumatic heart disease remains the commonest cause of valvular heart diseases in our country. So I thought we will have a series of lectures on various valvular diseases so that uh, the students, the postgraduate students and the young consultants, they become familiar with these conditions and how to diagnose them and how to treat them and when to refer them to the specialist. Background, uh, streptococcal infection is very common uh, because of poverty, because of overcrowding, because of lack of health facilities, because of uh, lack of awareness, uh, this condition still persists. Luckily, in majority, this streptococcal infection comes and goes without leaving behind any sequelae. But in some cases, it could damage the valve, it could damage the myocardium, it could damage the pericardium. And Sometimes the, everything else gets okay, but the valvular heart disease becomes progressive. And typically, patient remains symptom-free for a long time, like maybe for years and decades. And later on, when there is progressive fibrosis, damage of valve, patient presents with various symptoms. So remember that majority of the patient with valvular heart disease they may not actually even remember that they had rheumatic fever in the past. Uh, so history is very important, but uh, in many, in about 50% of the cases, there will be no history of rheumatic fever. But from the pattern of the valvular disease, we can tell from the, the, the pathology uh, we see, we can tell that this is actually rheumatic in origin. Now, since we have four valves, we have mitral valve, we have aortic valve, we have pulmonary valve, we have tricuspid valve. We have four valves in the heart, so theoretically any valve could be affected. But because left side is a high pressure system and is prone to more damage due to pressure, so the commonest valve involved in rheumatic valvular heart disease is mitral, followed by aortic. Pulmonary and tricuspid valves are only rarely affected. And in fact, many times pulmonary and tricuspid valve may be secondary to mitral and aortic valve disease. And it is also very unlikely to have pure aortic valve disease in the absence of mitral valve disease. So, in most patients with rheumatic heart disease, there would be mitral valve damage with or without other valvular damages. Uh, now, valve has got only two functions. It opens and it closes. Now, if valve is damaged, it might not open properly and that condition is called stenosis. And it might not close properly and that is called regurgitation. The blood regurgitates back into the chamber, the previous chamber. And in many conditions, you would actually have combined lesion. On clinical examination, one condition may be predominant, uh, but there would be, in most situations, a combined lesion. So there could be pure mitral stenosis, pure mitral regurgitation, or predominant mitral stenosis with mitral regurgitation, or predominant mitral regurgitation with mitral stenosis. So the causes, the commonest cause is rheumatic. I think if you do not have any clue to the etiology, any patient with valvular heart disease in our country should be considered to be rheumatic. Uh, of course, there are some congenital uh, valvular diseases and some degenerative 
valvular diseases also but they are less common than rheumatic now this is the structure of the heart uh, you can recognize various valves two valves are shown in this picture this is actually left sided heart this is a mitral valve this is the posterior cusp and this is the anterior cusp and you can see in this cartoon that the cusps are thicker not only that these cusps are there is uh, there is a stenosis because these this this cusp should have gone like this toward the interventricular septum and this cusp should have gone backward these are cordy and these are the muscles and this is left atrium so blood normally flows from left atrium to the left ventricle during the stay without any obstruction and the valve is normally so big that even in the first third of the diastole the blood which has collected in the left atrium during the last previous systole empties into the left ventricle and during the middle and the last part of the diastole the blood comes from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium and then goes on to the left ventricle so there is no obstruction at all in mitral stenosis of course because this valve is narrowed now it would take more and more time for left atrium to to empty its contents into the uh, left ventricle in typical patient the patient who is symptomatic uh, the blood would continue to pass from the left atrium to the left ventricle with pressure throughout the diastole and even when the diastole is fresh the blood is still high the pressure in the left atrium is still high so that is why we this condition causes problem now this is the aorta valve this is the valve which opens toward the aorta and in this case it is not affected now this is the echocardiogram in all congenital heart diseases and in all rheumatic heart diseases the investigation of choice is echocardiography because echocardiography tells us in uh, everything in detail the structure of the valves and if there are any vegetations if there are any thrombi the size of the chambers and even the flow the direction of flow the quantity of blood flow which way it is flowing and i think uh, echo is of course a great investigation now this is very much like this one you can appreciate that the left atrium is increase in size and this cusp if you can follow this cursor this cusp which is actually bending backward shows that there is uh, uh, the commissures are fused and the cusp this cusp is goes this one and there is little small lumen and this is the aorta valve and this is left ventricle this is left atrium now this was just a little orientation and then of course we are going to discuss this in more detail so that you have a very very good idea what this condition is etiology and pathology almost always rheumatic we are talking about mitral valvular disease mitral stenosis although there is a condition where mitral stenosis can occur as a congenital disease uh, i think it is called lutum baker syndrome it occurs with um, asd but uh, mostly most cases 99 out of 100 cases of mitral stenosis you would see in your practice they would have rheumatic etiology now valve cusps they thicken and fuse along edges and orifice becomes progressively narrow uh, a normal valve is approximately 4 cm square and symptoms start when it narrows down to 1.5 centimeter square cubic square you so you can see uh, there is a lot of difference between 4 centimeter and 1.5 centimeter that means there is long time patient has a valvular stenosis but there are no symptoms especially if this patient has a relatively sedentary lifestyle does not have too much exertion now, if patient has got a lot of physical activity he might have symptom at this stage also and it is called severe stenosis when the orifice is uh, 
comes down to one centimeter, most patients would have symptoms of dyspnea and palpitation at this, and 0.5 is extremely critical. Now, of course, we do not go by the valve size alone. We go by patient's condition. If patient is symptomatic, even at this level, patient should be operated. Or if the patient is not symptomatic, maybe even we can wait at this level also. So, but this is actually very, very good uh, concept. And uh, we, we uh, have a lot of useful, we get a lot of useful information from ECHO. And these areas can very accurately be calculated on ECHO. Uh, this is the pathology of uh, uh, mitral valve taken from a person who died, uh, unfortunately. Now, this is you are looking at the mitral valve from the left atrial side. You see that the valve is going to the other side and this is a lumen. It's a fairly small lumen, mitral stenosis. And this is the structure of the stenosed mitral valve when you're looking at it from the left ventricular side and this typically gives you the impression of fish mouth this is called fish mouth deformity a fish mouth deformity is not a clinical sign it is not even an echo sign this is a pathological sign but this is nice way of describing the actual pathology which develops in patient with mitral stenosis this i guess is the most important slide now if you understand this uh, then you can understand all the clinical features and the murmur and you will also understand when to do a procedure called uh, ptmc okay so we are going to develop pathophysiology of mitral stenosis the first thing is because mitral valve is narrowed and narrowed very very significantly so the blood is not properly flowing from the left atrium to the left ventricle so there is a left atrial increase in pressure and volume both right i told you earlier that normally mitral valve is so big that even in the first third of diastole uh, all the blood in the left atrium, which has collected during the previous systole, empties into the left ventricle. And in the remaining part of the diastole, the blood just comes from the pulmonary vein, passes through the left atrium and goes to the left ventricle. In cases of mitral stenosis, because the valve, the valve is narrowed, blood accumulates in the left atrium and that leads to dilatation, of left atrium and increase in the size of left atrium and that is actually a very important sign clinically as well as radiologically as well as on echo and ecg so dilatation of left atrium and increased pressure in the left atrium is a very important pathophysiological component now you know there is no valve between left atrium and pulmonary vein so the pressure which develops in the left atrium will uh, go back into the pulmonary veins so there will be pulmonary venous hypertension normally pulmonary veins they have very low pressure like 12 millimeter, 12 millimeter of mercury but in this case pressure builds up and that pressure Actually, this is a pulmonary venous hypertension. This is a passive phenomenon. This is only because the, there is a stenosis. If you can open up mitral valve, this pulmonary venous hypertension should be reversible. This is important because once pulmonary arterial hypertension develops, that may be irreversible. So this is to differentiate from pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, of course, pulmonary veins then uh, further backward are pulmonary capillaries. This is the very, very delicate structures. They can uh, sustain only a certain pressure. The maximum pressure they can sustain is, I think, about 30 millimeter mercury. Once pressure exceeds that, the fluid oozes out into the interstitium and then the alveoli. Now, this condition is called pulmonary edema. Uh, 
patient would typically develop severe dyspnea at rest. Many patients with mitral stenosis, they present to the hospital only when they develop pulmonary edema. So what is pulmonary edema? It is the oozing out of fluid of the blood into the pulmonary interstitium and pulmonary alveoli. So that would of course impair, the, that would affect pulmonary ventilation and patient would develop uh, pulmonary edema and very severe dyspnea. It would also translate into classical radiological signs. Now, of course, one cannot live with pulmonary uh, edema. So hopefully this patient will receive medical treatment and then will recover, but only to go into pulmonary edema again if patient does not get a proper long-term treatment. But as a result of this pulmonary venous hypertension, there is then pulmonary arterial hypertension. Arteries are active organs. There is first uh, construction of the artery, arterial walls, then there is hypertrophy, then there is fibrosis. So pulmonary arterial hypertension becomes more and more irreversible. And this pulmonary arterial hypertension would cause right ventricular hypertrophy and right ventricular dilatation. And this, you, we are not talking about somebody who had mitral stenosis for very, very long, unfortunately undiagnosed or untreated. Now that patient has developed right ventricular hypertrophy and then dilatation. Now once right ventricular dilate, there could be tricuspid regurgitation. Tricuspid regurgitation, tricuspid valve itself may be normal, but since right, right ventricle is dilated, the cusp uh, ring is stretched, so the cusp they do not meet and they cause uh, tricuspid regurgitation and there could be hepatic congestion and once this happens, there are other signs of tricuspid regurgitation. So I hope I was able to uh, explain why and how uh, various clinical features of mitral stenosis develops. This is the natural history of mitral stenosis if not treated. Now, unfortunately, there are several things which can happen and they can actually make the natural history further worse. One is, uh, we just talked about the fact that blood is not going, uh, is not, uh, is, is staying back in the left atrium. But it is also not going to the left ventricle because uh, the blood, because of the stenosis. So left ventricle is not receiving the proper amount of venous return and is not pumping the proper amount of blood. So that would lead to reduced cardiac output. So reduced Cardiac output can cause lethargy, can cause a drop in blood pressure, can occasionally cause cardiogenic shock also. Now then there is a complication, the most dreadful complication of mitral valve disease is atrial fibrillation. Whichever condition uh, makes our sinus node unstable, that would promote atrial fibrillation. In patient with mitral stenosis, because atria are dilated, atrial muscle is stretched, so sinus node becomes unstable and that promotes atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation can be clinically recognized by irregularly irregular fast rate, pulse rate. It has not only one additional complication, but it actually makes the hemodynamics very, very bad. Bad, I mean, in the sense, that patient is already struggling, but this fast rate will make the hemodynamic changes worse. Now, let me explain this. Uh, I just said that in mitral stenosis, the left atrial contents, they do not go to the left ventricle even till the end of diastole. Now, whenever there is tachycardia, whether it is sinus tachycardia or SVT or atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation is a type of tachycardia. So, whenever there is atrial fibrillation, uh, the duration of diastole will become further short. So, even the, the full length diastole was not allowing the left atrium to uh, empty its contents to the left ventricle. So, once uh, the diastole becomes further short, so there will be further rise in left atrial pressure and most of these patients, they would go to pulmonary edema. Uh, 
because of this reduced dastly uh, duration. So I hope I was able to explain this why atrial fibrillation. fibrillation is a serious condition in its own right, but it is also going to make the hemodynamic changes in mitral sources worse. Then there is a possibility of thromboembolism. Normally the circulation is very very smooth. There is no stagnation anywhere because all valves are fairly big. Blood flows down uh, uh, without any obstruction. But in mitral stenosis, because of the stagnation, there is a possibility that the clot may be formed in the left atrium, particularly left atrial appendage. Now, if that clot stays there, it might not uh, give you any problem. But just incidentally, any time that clot might get dislodged and go on to the uh, systemic circulation, now, depending upon where it lands up, it would cause some signs. Like it could uh, uh, end up in brain causing paralysis or eye causing blindness or it could end up in some other organs causing gangrene. Or, so I think that is another issue. Any patient with mitral stenosis is prone to develop thromboembolism, especially the one who has developed atrial fibrillation also. Because in atrial fibrillation, left atrium does not contract. So since left atrium does not contract, it would act as a passive chamber. Passive chamber with obstruction of mitral sources will be an ideal situation for the clot formation. So that clot would be dislodged and that would cause uh, thromboembolism. Now many times this patient may be absolutely asymptomatic until they develop thromboembolism and only once they present with stroke, we investigate and we find out actually they had mitral valvular disease. Now another complication of any valvular disease, whether it is congenital or rheumatic, whether it is stenotic or uh, uh, regurgitation, that is infective endocarditis. Uh, infective endocarditis because of abnormal flow of blood, there is the jet effect, there is uh, erosion of the endocardium and whenever there is bacteremia, there is a possibility of endocarditis. I would have a separate lecture on endocarditis, but people with valvular heart disease, they tend to have, they, they may develop endocarditis. Now, all patients with valvular, valvular heart disease are not equally prone. Uh, mitral stenosis alone is not a very strong risk factor, whereas mitral regurgitation and aortic valve disease is much stronger uh, risk factor for development of endocarditis because in mitral stenosis, there isn't much of that jet effect. The pressure difference between uh, left atrium and left ventricle is not much. So this is the natural history and any unlucky person would develop these complications and that will make the natural history worse and that un unfortunately may be the presenting problem. So our job is that whenever you see a patient and whenever you can make a diagnosis, you should refer the patient to the cardiologist so that that patient gets proper evaluation and proper treatment. Symptoms of mitral stenosis, there aren't any symptom that you can correctly diagnose the mitral stenosis, but most patients would develop dyspnea. Dyspnea is actually an asymptom, uh, is a non-specific symptoms, and many patients with mitral stenosis, when, whenever they have pulmonary edema, they would complain of dyspnea. There are various uh, grades of dyspnea, various stages of dyspnea. I will cover that also in a separate lecture. There may be cough or there may be hemoptysis. These patients, they have very typical frothy, pinkish expectoration. Frothy because there is air mixed with the fluid and pinkish because there may be some blood in it. Palpitation, of course, uh, palpitation is a common symptom, especially when these patients, they develop uh, atrial fibrillation. So these are common symptoms, but none of them is very, very specific. But they should actually uh, suggest that there is a cardiac problem. Stroke, gangrene, loss of vision, these are complications of thromboembolic phenomenon.
physical signs uh, i think if on the basis of symptoms you can suspect mitral stenosis on physical examination you should be able to make a proper diagnosis any experienced person uh, should be able to make a proper diagnosis of mitral stenosis on examination alone tapping apex bead what is tapping apex bead when we put our hand on the precordium and if you feel as if something is somebody is tapping from within the chest you feel the thirst but you do not get any displacement uh, it is like you put a hand on the wall and somebody is hammering on the other side you feel that thirst but there is no actual displacement of the uh, wall so that kind of feeling you this is actually the palpable loud first sound plus a loud first sound i'll explain to you uh, how uh, the first sound becomes very loud in patient with mitral stenosis and that is actually an important clinical sign then left parasternal heave this is because of the right ventricular hypertrophy if you remember hemodynamic changes there is right ventricular hypertrophy the loud first sound of this i'm going to explain this is the normal well uh, when the, uh, the first sound you know consists of two components the s1 the the, the mitral component when left ventricle contracts uh, the first sound is produced by the closure of mitral valve right and also tricuspid valve but let's concentrate on the mitral valve so a, when diastole is over because left atrium is already empty the cusps have already started moving toward the neutral position they are quite close to the neutral position when left ventricle systole starts and it then finally closes the valve so the distance through which these cusps have to move is very little so that is why the normal first sound is not very loud in patient with mitral stenosis because of increased left atrial pressure even the entire diastole is over pressure in the left atrium is still high so that is keeping these cusps away from the neutral position so they are not close to their neutral position they are quite away so when left ventricle contraction occurs of course left ventricular uh, contraction will generate lot of force it will finally uh, shut it, it finally close the mitral valve against this left atrial pressure because of the high left atrial pressure the cusp is quite away from the neutral position and when left ventricle contracts the cusp cusp move from a very long distance toward the neutral position so that is why it produces a loud sound but you need to have what we call pliable valves if the valves are very badly calcified damage then despite of mitral stenosis you may not have loud first sound but in relatively early patients who have significant raised left atrial pressure but the cusps are still pliable you will get loud first sound very classical sign of course there are other causes of loud first sound but loud first sound with the murmur is very typical of mitral stenosis there may be loud pulmonary component of the second sound this is because there is pulmonary hypertension i just explain in hemodynamics that there is pulmonary venous hypertension followed by pulmonary arterial hypertension that would cause pulmonary component of the second sound rather loud then opening snap this is very interesting normally the opening of mitral valve does not produce any sound because the opening pressure the pressure in the left atrium is only a few millimeter mercury but in patient with mitral stenosis since left atrial pressure is fairly high that so the opening force whenever the left ventricular systole is over the left atrial pressure opens the cusp like this so that creates an opening snap and you can also imagine that higher the pressure quicker will be the opening and earlier will be the opening snap 
so the presence of opening snap and the proximity of opening snap to the pulmonary component of the second sound would indicate mitral stenosis and it would also indicate that the mitral indicate uh, the mitral stenosis is quite severe uh, we are continuing with the physical signs uh, we have discussed uh, uh, few things but now comes the most important thing the most important the cardinal sign of patient with mitral stenosis there is mid diastolic murmur with the pre systolic accentuation of course the blood flows across the mitral valve from left atrium to the left ventricle during diastole and if the valve is narrowed that will produce sound and that sound will be in the diastole so that is why we have mid diastolic murmurs what is meant by pre systolic accentuation toward the end of the diastole uh, left atrial contraction occurs normally this left atrial contraction uh, empties all the contents of the left atrium into the left ventricle now in these patients there is stenosis so there is a murmur but when left atrial contraction occurs the pressure gradient between left atrium and left ventricle further rises and because of that murmur increases in intensity so there would be mid diastolic murmur with pre systolic accentuation now please note down if there is no left atrial contraction there would be no pre systolic accentuation and if the patient has developed mitral uh, the sorry atrial fibrillation then there would be no left atrial contraction and there would be no pre systolic accentuation so you would have a, a mid diastolic mid diastolic murmur with pre systolic accentuation this murmur is localized to apex and it has got no radiation it would be best heard on the apex of the heart uh, that is fifth intercostal space just medial to the uh, uh, mid clavicular line and it is better heard with bell of course it is heard with the diaphragm also being a low frequency murmur it is best heard with the bell and it is rough and rumbling in character now what does exactly these words mean i might not be able to explain but if you remember these words rough and rumbling so this is the character of this murmur now if you auscultate few patient with mitral stenosis then you will realize what exactly these word mean so rough and rumbling mid diastolic murmur with pre systolic uh, accentuation is very typical of mitral stenosis this is the graphic representation this is a normal uh, heart a first sound just one component and second heart sound two component the first one is aortic the second one is pulmonary and then there is diastole so systole diastole and then repeating itself systole is slightly shorter than diastole now this is the patient with mitral stenosis first of all you notice that i have drawn this bar little thicker and taller this indicates loud first sound so if you can print this picture in your mind then you will be able to reproduce these physical signs first heart sound is loud indicated by thick and tall uh, line then pulmonary component is also uh, loud because this line is louder then there is an opening snap this line is normally not present opening snap sound will be present and the proximity of opening snap indicates the severity closer the opening snap more severe the stenosis then there is mid diastolic murmur the initial part there is no murmur but then there is mid diastolic murmur it stays of the same intensity but toward the end there is pre systolic accentuation okay so if you remember this picture mid diastolic murmur with pre systolic accentuation in the diastole so this is the graphic representation of auscultatory signs of mitral stenosis diagnosis of mitral stenosis uh, there are several ways of making diagnosis one is clinical i think most experienced patient uh, physician they should be able to make 
a clinical diagnosis but ecg may also help ecg may show signs of left atrial enlargement and this is called p mitral and i'll show you what it means then there may be right ventricular hypertrophy and xhs may show certain changes which are described as mitralization because these changes are most commonly seen in patients with mitral stenosis so they are referred to as mitralization although many other diseases uh, like mitral regurgitation primary pulmonary hypertension can also cause similar morphological changes uh, then echocardiogram i have highlighted clinical and echocardiogram so all these are important but in my opinion if you have a proper clinical examination you could go straight for echocardiogram and you will have the right diagnosis this is the ecg and if uh, you can this this shows p mitral now if you if you see this part i'm not sure if you can uh, appreciate it uh, but i'm going to blow it up for you this is the p wave p wave is bifid now let me just blow it up for you this is the magnified part i have uh, taken this part and magnified this and p wave has become bifid so if p wave is uh, broader than 0.2 uh, seconds which is three small squares and is bifid particularly if the second deflection is bigger than the first one this would indicate uh, uh, mitral left atrial enlargement actually and the commonest cause of left atrial enlargement is mitral valve disease so this is the p mitral this is you may get in uh, on ecg this test is not done but just for the sake of completion this is the x-ray and you can see uh, this is the aortic knuckle this cursor is at the level of aortic knuckle and this is left ventricle normally this part is actually concave and there is there are two structures in this concavity uh, pulmonary rt and left atrium in mitral stenosis both are dilated and because left atrium and pulmonary rt are dilated this concavity first becomes concave a kind of straight and then it becomes convex so this actually convex part indicates left atrium and left pulmonary artery dilatation and this is what is called mitralization there may be a little bit of pulmonary congestion also little bit of cardiomegaly because of right ventricular dilatation but basic abnormality is in the cardiac cell now this is the barium swallow uh, uh, normally we do not do barium swallow for this purpose because we have better technique but in the past they used to do barium swallow to determine left atrial enlargement now this is for example barium and this is esophagus passing behind the heart and this part is left atrium if left atrium enlarged if left left atrium is enlarged then the barium swallow would show esophagus uh, like this uh, i think just for the sake of completion most important way of diagnosing uh, mitral stenosis is echocardiography now this is echocardiogram and of course uh, you need uh, special training to do echocardiography and to interpret it but you can see that the left atrium is definitely dilated you can see normally left atrium is as big as this aorta you don't see aorta completely here this is a two dimensional echocardiogram left atrium is definitely dilated here and the cusps are definitely thicker normally cusps are just paper thin and the cusps are doming into the left ventricular outflow tract indicating that they, they are fused at commissions you have just very small lumen left this is a lumen and this is left ventricle and in this case aortic valve is also diseased but we are not discussing that and this is the typical fish mouth deformity which we see on pathological samples but we can also see on echocardiogram now i'm passing my cursor along the mitral valve uh, and you can actually draw a line here there is a built-in computer in echocardiogram uh, once you bring the line back to its original point uh, 
immediately it will give you the surface area now you can actually calculate the lumen and you can tell how severe uh, the disease is so echocardiography will not only give you the diagnosis a definitive diagnosis but will also tell you if there is any complication like left atrial uh, clot or if there is any endocarditis or if there is any additional valvular disease which you did not suspect it clinically i think diagnosis of any valvular heart disease is not complete without a proper 2d echo this is a m mode echocardiography uh, normally echocardiography m uh, the mitral valve makes this kind of structure m shape uh, i will not be able to go into the detail although i love to describe how this thing develops but i think that will take it beyond the scope of my audience so this is a normal pattern you can see this m pattern and you can also appreciate the thinness of these valves here there are three abnormalities one this line has become much more thickened as compared to this one so mitral valve is tenos number two these waves they come at regular intervals these come at irregular intervals that means there is atrial fibrillation also number three this m shape uh, pattern has lost once mitral valve opens it does not close in a normal person mitral valve opens then during the diastole the cusp come back and then go back again when left atrial contraction and then finally they close when left ventricular contraction occurs that is how we have this m complex first mitral valve open then they close because the pressure in the left atrium has reduced and the valves have moved back to their neutral position but at the end there is atrial contraction causing this second wave and that thing does not happen here because once mitral valve opens it never closes because the pressure in the left atrium does not allow cusp to come back so that is why we have this kind of thing the slow pattern so th this is very very characteristic i think anybody who knows the uh, echo uh, just by looking at this image will tell you that this patient has got severe mitral stenosis with atrial fibrillation and uh, so this is m mode echocardiography management now we're coming to the end of this con uh, condition of course um, we have to treat the medical management first we try to control heart rate now i already explained to you heart rate is important because faster heart rate, heart rate would mean shorter diastole a shorter diastole means uh, more pressure in the left atrium and more chances of pneumonia so we try to keep heart rate with the limits now if patient is in sinus rhythm then beta blockers are very good drugs or maybe the new drug vebradine can also be used but if patient is in atrial fibrillation then beta blockers are not very effective then we use digoxin so digoxin uh, can help to reduce the heart rate sometimes we have to use both but the purpose is only to keep heart rate from increasing diuretics would be useful when we have to treat their pulmonary edema and uh, we typically use loop diuretics because we need immediate and potent diuresis and they can be used in long term also anticoagulations we have a long list of anticoagulants uh, but in this condition warfarin is still considered to be the best warfarin would be used on long term basis to prevent any thromboembolism then endocarditis prophylaxis these patients are uh, prone to develop endocarditis which is another very serious condition so whenever these patient undergo any procedure they are given a course of antibiotics the antibiotics is selected according to the site of procedure uh, because the bacteria is going to be uh, based on that site which is operated if somebody undergoes dental extraction uh, we might give some penicillin based antibiotics and if somebody undergoes some urogenital procedure some then uh, some antibiotic against gram negative bacteria are given typically they are given intravenously typically we start 48 hours before the surgery and continue it for at least 24 hours before the surgery and continue till 48 hours after surgery so that these patients do not develop uh, endocarditis so this was medical management
the another uh, interesting management is is what is called PTMC. Now many students they cannot figure out what is this PTMC. If I if you can figure out or if you remember what is PTMC, I think then you can understand the entire procedure. This is percutaneous because this procedure is done through a catheter. Transseptal. It's, it's not transcutaneous. Transseptal means that the catheter goes from the right atm into the left atm by puncturing the septum septum why we do have why do we have to uh, puncture the septum to get into the left side why can't we go from the aorta there's a story behind that but i think you just uh, know that we get to the left atm from the low pressures to the venous side from puncturing the right uh, the, the intervent intraatrial septum then goes to the uh, left atrium and then catheter is deployed in the mitral lumen. so this is mitral commissurotomy commissurotomy means once balloon is inflated the commissures they will open up so percutaneous transseptal mitral commissurotomy this is a procedure which is done in those patients who have significant mitral stenosis but there are a number of contraindications uh, I may be able to tell you uh, in the next slide. So PTMC, if significant stenosis plus valve is pliable, if the valve is very, very brittle, calcified, thick, it might not be suitable. There is no or minimal calcification. There is no clot in left atrium because this is a relatively blind procedure. If there is a clot in the left atrium and you open the valve, you might actually dislodge the clot into the systemic circulation and patient could end up with a serious problem like stroke and there is no mitral regurgitation why because this procedure will address only mitral stenosis a patient has got significant additional mitral regurgitation and symptoms are primarily due to the mitral regurgitation then ptmc is not going to help of course uh, one can have a combination of mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation. Then cardiologist will decide if, in his opinion, it is a predominant mitral stenosis. He might still uh, like to do PTMC even if the patient has mitral regurgitation, a better mitral regurgitation. So this is the picture. Catheter goes to the right atrium. From here it goes to the left atrium. From here it comes to the mitral valve, and here it is inflated. So this is. In the left atrium, this is part of the left atrium. This is left atrium and left ventricle. And this kink shows the lumen of mitral valve, which is stenosed. And th then you uh, inflate it and then it opens up. So this picture shows that it is now open. Then you take out the catheter and patient's symptoms improve dramatically. This is relatively... Uh, it's, just a, it's not a non-invasive, but it's a catheter-based operation and patient has got a lot of benefits. Sometime it might have to be repeated later. But unfortunately, every patient is not a proper candidate. Others would require surgery. If the valve is too bad, then the patient might need repair. Uh, in our country, there is a lot of emphasis on repairing the valve and but in uh, if the valve is not repairable then it might be replaced and there are a number of options we have prosthetic valves we have metallic valve we have biological valve we have artificial material valve and we can ha have valve from another human or cadaver so i think that is uh, beyond the scope of this lecture so surgery would be definitely a last resort Thank you very much. Uh, this has been Professor Azizur Rahman from Madistan and I look forward to see you in my next lecture. The next lecture is going to be a quiz on mitrosnosis. This quiz is like actually a repetition, a repetition and uh, 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 in the form of an interesting quiz. So please, after watching this video, video watch that one also so that the message is printed in your mind thank you very much really looking forward to see you in my next video find more lectures on medicine thank you